guys welcome to dental classes for you today we shall discuss on the topic cohort study in the previous class of analytical epidemiology we have discussed about case control study today we shall discuss about cohort study this study is also referred to as prospective study longitudinal or incidence of forward looking study okay now we will see important points regarding cohort study before moving on to that we must know what cohort means cohort is simply a group of people who share a common characteristic so cohort can be defined as a group of people who share a common characteristic or experience within a defined time period for example it could be either like age or occupation or exposure to a particular drug or vaccine etc one example for this is birth cohort what does birth cohort mean is that it is a group of people who have been born on the same day or the same year etc Now moving on to the salient features of cohort study you must know that cohorts are identified prior to the appearance of disease in case control study we have studied that both the exposure as well as the disease have occurred prior to the onset of the study okay but here the cohorts are identified prior to the appearance of the disease the disease has not occurred yet okay now the study groups are observed over a period of time to determine the disease frequency okay also we all know that it is a prospective study or forward looking study that is the study proceeds forward from cause to effect okay that is from exposure to disease okay now moving on to the framework or the design of a cohort study it's exactly opposite to that what we have studied in case control study that is we start from exposed and non exposed group of people that is exposed forms the cohort and non exposed form the comparison group and then we study them through follow ups and see whether they develop the disease or not okay and if you find that if there is occurrence of disease or incidence of disease more in exposed group than in non exposed group we can say that there is an association that exists between the exposure as well as the outcome okay now moving on to the indications when is cohort study indicated the foremost point is when there is a good evidence of association that exists between the exposure as well as the disease and the study it can be either through clinical observations or from your case control study and descriptive epidemiologic studies okay it is indicated when exposure is rare but incidence is very high among the exposed also when attrition of study group can be minimized that is when there is minimal attrition or loss to follow up and finally it is done in cases where there is ample funds available that is cohort studies are very expensive now moving on to the important points regarding this study that is cohorts must be free from the disease under study and both the groups should be equally susceptible to the disease under study also both the groups should be comparable with respect to all possible variables that might influence the study and diagnostic and eligibility criteria should be defined beforehand So that forms the basic idea of cohort study. Now we'll move on to the types of cohort study in detail. Okay, the three types of cohort study they are prospective study, retrospective study, and a combination of both prospective and retrospective study. In prospective study, the disease has not yet occurred. That is, we are going to start the study prior to the onset of the disease. So what it means is that the study starts in the present, and then we'll do a follow up to study the. frequency of occurrence of the disease okay so that's about prospective study that is from the current to the future now when we are studying about retrospective study what it means is that the disease has already occurred so we then move 10 to 30 years back for example and then we start our study we obtain information through past records etc and then we start from the past to the present okay so that's referred to as retrospective study and retrospective study is way more economical and it provides quicker results now moving on to a combination of both prospective and retrospective study it is also referred to as ambispective study here what happens is it has the elements of both the studies in it that is both prospective and retrospective component in it the cohort is identified from past records then we start the study from the past till the present and then we look for the outcome in the future also that is we do a follow up also so it starts from past to the present and to the future so it is referred to as ambispective or a combination of both of these studies okay hope you have understood the types of cohort study now moving on to the elements or the steps in case of a cohort study there are five main elements they are 
selection of study subject, obtaining data on exposure, selection of comparison groups, follow up and analysis. So first of all, it is the selection of study subjects. Study subjects can be obtained from general population or special groups. Okay. General population means those who are living in well-defined geographical areas. And if the population under study is very large, then you can select samples from the general population which are representative of the population. Okay. Now moving on to special groups, it can be either select groups or exposure groups. These select groups could be like professional groups like doctors, nurses, they could be teachers or they could be government employees etc. And coming on to exposure groups, an example can be of a radiologist who is getting exposed to x-rays. Okay. Now moving on to the next step that is obtaining data on exposure. The data can be collected from cohort members, it can be obtained through review of records, it can be through medical examination or special tests or it could be from environmental surveys. Okay? That is, when you are obtaining data on exposure from cohort members, it could be either through mail questionnaires or direct interviews etc. Since most of the cohort studies involve large number of population, it is better to use mail questionnaires to collect data from cohort. Then it can be from review of records. Records could be medical records, okay? And it could be based on medical examination and special tests like blood pressure, cholesterol, etc. And then it could be based on environmental surveys. And these environmental surveys are done to obtain information about the level of exposure in the environment of that suspected factor, okay? Obtaining data on exposure should also involve classification of the obtained information based on whether they have been exposed or not to the suspected factor and also they have to be classified based on the level or degree of exposure into broad classes okay now moving on to the third point that is the comparison group selection here selection of the comparison group can be either by internal comparison external comparison or it could be a comparison with general population rates First of all, in internal comparison, what it means is there is an inbuilt comparison group. That is, there is no requirement of an external comparison group. That is, the members of a single cohort can be classified based on the degree or levels of exposure into broad classes and these classes can act as comparison groups. Now, moving on to external comparison. In cases where you cannot obtain an internal comparison or where you cannot classify the cohort based on certain characteristics like degree or levels of exposure, then we will have to move for an external comparison group that could include for example smokers and non-smokers. Okay. Now comparison with the general population rates. Here when you compare the group with that of a general population rate, there are certain limitations. One of the limitation is the non-availability of population rate for the outcomes required. Another difficulty is in the selection of cohort and comparison group which are representative of those exposed and non-exposed in the general population. Now let's move on to the next element of cohort study that is follow-up. So here we all know that in cohort study it is a prospective study that is we are moving from the cause to effect. So this will require follow-up. These follow-up procedures can be either periodic medical examination of members of cohort, it could be reviewing physician and hospital records, it could be the routine surveillance of death records and also mail questionnaires, phone calls, frequent home visits etc. to obtain that. Okay. Now, the safest course in follow-up is 95% follow-up. That is, there may be an inevitable loss of follow-up in certain cases like the person has migrated or due to death of the person under study, etc. These cases are referred to as attrition or loss of follow-up. So, it is considered that about 95% follow-up is considered as the safest course of follow-up, okay? Now, moving on to the final step that is analysis. Here, before moving on to the analysis part, we will consider an example that has been given in Sobin Peter itself. That is, you consider a risk factor that is, for example, tobacco chewing. So, there are people who are tobacco chewers and those who are non-chewers. That is, exposed and non-exposed group of people. Then you see how many of them developed oral cancer over a period of time and how many of them did not develop the oral cancer. Then we will consider the total number of people considered. Okay. So, 
For example, if we have given here some values, okay. For example, those who had tobacco chewers developed oral cancer were 45 people out of the total 10,000 study. And those who were non-chewers and who developed oral cancer were 5 under 10,000 total people, okay. Now we will see what we are going to calculate. First of all, we will calculate the incident rate among the exposed group of people, okay. Incidence rate among the exposed. Exposed means those who were tobacco chewers here, for example. So that is 45 among the total, that is 10,000. Okay. So you get 45 by 10,000. Per thousand, if you convert it, it will become 4.5 per thousand. Okay. Now, among non exposed, the incident rate similarly will become 5 out of 10,000, that is 0.5 per thousand. Okay. So that's how you calculate the incident rate from the cohort state. Now moving on to relative risk or risk ratio, RR, okay. Here it is the ratio of incidence of the disease among the exposed population divided by the incidence among the non-exposed group, okay. Here from this calculation you have already calculated the incident rate among exposed and non-exposed, you substitute and you get the value, okay. This ratio that is the relative risk or risk ratio is a better index in assessing the etiological role of the factor in the disease, okay. Now moving on to attributable risk or AR, it is also referred to as risk difference. Here in attributable risk, we initially find the difference between the incidence of disease rate among the exposed and the incidence of disease rate among the non-exposed and then further divide it by the incidence rate among the exposed. So substituting these values, you have 4.5 as the incidence rate among exposed and 0.5 among non-exposed. So, you will get some value here. So, that is referred to as attributable risk or AR. This kind of risk that is attributable risk finds more value or importance in case of public health programs. Okay. So, that is about the fifth step and final step that is analysis. So, you have calculated the incidence rate, relative risk and attributable risk here. So, that is about the elements of cohort study. Now, let us study about the bias in cohort study. Here, in cohort study, there are four important types of bias. They are selection bias, information bias, confounding bias and post hoc bias. That is, in selection bias, for example, many people originally selected in the cohort group might refuse to participate in the study. That is, non-consent bias. Another example is in case of loss of follow-up, which we have already discussed. Now, moving on to information bias, for example, it is a diagnostic bias. That is, in case of diagnostic bias, if you already know the subject's exposure to a factor and a study, then you might proceed with more thorough diagnostic procedures. And so, that comes under information bias. Then coming on to confounding bias, you already know that confounding factor acts as a bias in case of the study. Okay. For example, age, smoking, etc. can be confounding factors. Now, moving on to the final type of bias discussed here, that is post hoc bias. Sometimes testing of hypothesis occurs that was not originally selected for the study. This is referred to as data dredging and the bias cost is referred to as post hoc bias. So the bias includes selection bias, information bias, confounding bias and post hoc bias. Okay. Now finally moving on to the advantages and disadvantages of the cohort study. Here advantages include it can be used to calculate the incidence. We have already done the calculation for incidence. Now, it can be used to provide direct estimate of relative risk, that too we have discussed. Several possible outcomes related to exposure can be studied simultaneously here. It can be used to calculate the dose-response ratios as well it can be used to eliminate certain types of bias. Okay. And now moving on to the disadvantages, it is unsuitable for rare or uncommon diseases. It takes longer time to complete the study. For example, if you are studying cancer, it might take about 10, 20, 30 years to complete the study. Now, it has certain administrative problems. For example, loss of experienced staff, loss of funding, etc. that occurs over the longer period of time. Now, it is very expensive. As we have discussed, there can be inevitable loss of follow-up here. Also, the comparison groups under the study may not be representative of all individuals with the characteristics of interest under study and there might be changes in methods or diagnostic criteria over a longer period of time. There may be ethical problems. Here, why you see ethical problems is because unlike in case control study, your cohort study is prospective. 
that is here in this study that is in cohort study what you do is you are even after obtaining evidence about an implicating factor in the etiology of a disease you are not intervening or trying to reduce the occurrence of the disease so it will have major ethical problems and finally there may be practical considerations also so this is cohort study in a nutshell we have discussed what cohort study means what are the salient features of cohort study what is the framework or design of a cohort study what are the elements of cohort study what kind of bias present in cohort study also we have discussed about advantages and disadvantages of cohort study hope you have understood the class for more such videos like share and subscribe thank you